with MR. Please, Dr. Kletos. Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for this invitation. I feel very honored being here with you. So, I would like to start my presentation by some basic notes about uh, mitral regurgitation assessment. So, once we investigate uh, mitral regurgitation, we must definitely distinguish if it is a primary or secondary, what is the mitral valve lesion anatomy, what is the MR degree, and uh, what is the left ventricular size and function, what is the pulmonary pressures, the tricuspid regurgitation, the LA volume, and finally to report the management and the prognosis. So, primary and secondary, this is very important. The most important thing when we investigate mitral valve is actually to see if there's a pathology in the leaflet. So, if it's an organic MR, as we say, as we call the primary mitral regurgitation, the most common cause is the mitral valve prolapse. The standard measurement suggested by the European Society of Cardiology is the vena contracta, the PISA radius, and the derived ERO the density of the Doppler of the mitral leak, the systolic wave of the pulmonary veins, and of course, a color mode would give additional information about the duration of the mitral valve gazetation. As we see the management plan of the AMR, we see that the symptoms is the most important factor. So when the symptoms are obvious at rest, then there is no question. Transthoracic echo and TOE would be definitely sufficient for investigating this valve. However, when the symptoms are not there, then we have to proceed to functional tests. This could be an exercise treadmill echo or a bicycle valve stress echo. So, uh, sepine or semi-sepine bicycle exercise is preferable because there is a reduced risk of hemodynamic collapse in this position. It allows continuous two-dimensional and Doppler uh, measurements throughout the examination. Uh, there is the same position of the patient again throughout the test and cycling allows more isometric exercise than treadmill does and this will uh, increase the intraventricular intracavity pressures provoking mitral leak. The indications for proceeding in uh, uh, mitral regards MR valve stress echo would be a symptomatic mild or moderate MR and a symptomatic severe MR an asymptomatic mild to moderate MR pre or a moderate MR or a normal LV function with unexplained heart failure symptoms. This is the way that we normally perform a valve stress echo and there is a supine bicycle dedicated for cardiac, dedicated for, uh, cardiac uh, use and you can see that the stilt to the left side in order the heart to come closer to the thoracic wall and it is obvious that the sonographers and doctors who are left-handed uh, will, will definitely have an easier job to do. Now, uh, the protocol. The widely suggested protocol is uh, this one based on the uh, uh, World Health Organization um, uh, uh, workload protocol that it uh, actually includes uh, stages of two minutes with 25 watts each stage rise in the workload. A symptom limited, symptom limited uh, graded exercise test is recommended with a high uh, heart rate of 80% of the age predicted heart rate. And uh, we can reduce the workload per stage to 10 watts if there is, uh, we have patients with heart failure or with reduced physical activity. Two, uh, two things must be highlighted here. The first is that uh, throughout the test, we investigate, we measure the pulmonary pressures, the LV function, the MR, of course, itself, the jet and the PISA, and the diastolic function. So these are the measurements we do throughout the test. But regarding the Pulmonary pressures is very important to take the first measurements on the second minute because a very early rise in the pulmonary pressures uh, shows very bad prognosis. The other hand, the, the other thing we have to be careful is that the, the diastolic function must be definitely be uh, measured uh, before we reach the 100 beats per minute because after this heart rate, the ENA uh, uh, waves merge 
and there's diffusion, so it's not easy to determine it. So we have to keep in mind these two little details that must be very important. Moreover, if the MR is severe at rest, then, and we see throughout the test that it does not improve, then makes no sense continuing uh, uh, taking imaging from the MR. It will not be less. So we have more time to focus on other factors as the pulmonary pressures and the LV function. Which are, what is the aim of the test? To check first the contractile reserve. So if there is an uh, increase in injection fraction more than 4% or less than 2% increment in global longitudinal strain. The exercise capacity and the symptoms, of course. The MR severity, if we see an increase in the arrow, more than 13 square millimeters, then this is associated with uh, increased mortality in hospital admissions. The LV volume increase, the pulmonary pressures, that is a debatable, we will talk about this later, and the IRV, the right ventricle contractile equipment, this is normally we do it through TAPSE. So this is what we normally do, PISA at rest, PISA at um, uh, peak exercise. We are, uh, we, we are on the safe side when we have to do with organic MR because the PISA hemisphere is more like a hemisphere, a real hemisphere, so the PISA measurements are more accurate uh, in contrast with the uh, secondary MR where the semi-elliptical uh, shape of PISA does not always give accurate measurements. But is this, can we say that uh, MR uh, always increase throughout exercise? No. The answer is no, and the, the result of an exercise test in organic MR is really something unpredictable. In this case, in our lab, in the first department, cardiology in Hippocardia Hospital, this is an MR throughout the test that decreases. And the pulmonary pressures almost remain the same throughout the test. Please note that we keep an image, a black image, with the pulmonary pressure documented in the study itself, a not in a paper document. So, why is this? Let's go back a little bit to MR pathophysiology. So, the recursion orifice in matter regurgitation services on an escape valve. So there are two chambers, the LA and the LV, and the MR orifice between them. So the, 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 the grade of the MR actually depends on the surface of the orifice and the gradient between these two chambers. The gradient between these chambers means the preload and the afterload, in other words. And the other factor is the contractility and the contractile reserve of the LV. On top of this, please add the geometry of the mantra valve uh, leaf, of the, of the mantra valve and the coaptation surface of the leaflet that is different from case to case. So you understand that this is more or less a very complex mechanism that has different reactions through exercise. So, in other words, if we try to simplify this. If there is contractile resolve and the contractility is well sustained, then it is very likely that the MR will reduce. If not, it is very likely that the MR will increase because the, 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 the LV will dilate and the papillary muscles will reallocate it a little bit apically and the mitral lanius will change the shape and the orifice will be larger. Is it only the LV and the, and the mantra valve? No. The right of ventricle was found that plays a crucial role. So the level of the increase in pulmonary artery pressure, that means the right ventricular function, the ability to successfully recruit the pulmonary vasculatory, they have to accommodate the increased blood flow with exercise. The changes in pulmonary vascular compliance and resistance and dependence play a crucial role in how the, the person, the patient, will, ac will accommodate the new loading conditions. So in practice, parameters like this must be included in, a, in a mitral regurgitation valvular stress echo. A recent study showed that TAPSE less than 19 was giving additional information to uh, uh, prediction to the time until surgery is indicated. Very interesting study that uh, uh, is recent, quite recent. So, mitral valve stress echo with cardiac catheterization. 
The aim of the study was not to evaluate actually the Doppler measurements comparing to after cardiac catheterization. The aim of the study was not even to see what is our, what are, which are the, 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 the predictors for having a bad or good prognosis. The aim of the study was actually to define the mechanism of exercise intolerance in hemodynamically significant primary marital regurgitation. After all, what the, the, the outcome was that more or less this is that what, what we know about the pulmonary pressures, the contractile reserve, but on top of that was that um, the exercise, not the, the, the uh, competence, the uh, intolerance to, to exercise had to do again with the chronotopic competence and again the pulmonary, uh, re, uh, pulmonary reserve and the right, right ventricular function. So, organic MR and VAC, what we keep is that the patients with mild mental agitation and disproportionately severe symptoms, one third of them develop severe MR. I repeat, mild MR after exercise echo, they, they, they develop severe MR. Asymptomatic patients with moderate to severe degenerative MR, worsening exercise, it is up to one third they saw with marked increase in regardant volume. Exercise-induced pulmonary hypertension seems to be an adverse predictor of outcome, and the presence of normal v uh, ejection fraction in patients with severe MR may be misleading, as we know from physiology. Myocardial strain, very quickly, has its role, as always has, uh, showed through uh, the uh, studies two things. First, that if there is a mitral valve repair, then it can predict actually the, the ejection fraction after the mitral valve repair. And secondly, if it is m less than 20, then it shows that it is more likely this patient to need an operation in the near future. However, the current European guidelines did not recommend intervention in asymptomatic patients who develop severe MR with exercise. Nevertheless, we have to keep a close follow-up to these patients. There is a divergence in expert opinion between the American and uh, uh, European guidelines about this issue. And the American guidelines actually suggest that when the pulmonary pressures are over 50 at rest or 60 on exercise, must proceed to the next stage. Last thing is that, as we said, the main issue, the main reason for doing the stress echo is the symptoms and the pressures, of course. But the symptoms is something subjective. It's not subjective to the mood, to the culture, to the sex, to the oh, many reasons for which the patient will admit or not his symptoms. So what was suggested, proposed lately, is to, to merge this test with uh, uh, peak VO consumption in order with cardio cardiopulmonary exercise, in other words, in order to have a subjective um, uh, factor, marker, of the, of the symptoms. So, the key points. The PCM method is highly recommended to quantitate the severity of organic MR. Definitely, we explain the reasons. Key point two, the measurement of vena contract are recommended to quantify MR. It is very reliable. The Doppler volumetric method is not recommended at rest, either at rest or at stress of cardiography. Excess tolerance depends on the ability of the cardiovascular system in total, to increase the oxygen supply during exertion according to the increase of ox in oxygen com uh, uh, consumption by increasing cardiac output. Therefore, the peak oxygen consumption corresponds to the exercise tolerance. And this, as we said, includes the left ventricle and the right ventricle as well. Exercise testing may begin to play an important role in the timing of intervention in symptomatic patients with valvular heart disease. And this actually, I would like to add here that uh, we don't have, of course, we need to uh, intervene at the right uh, moment. However, I can see many times that doctors are getting very scared of, uh, a, mitral, of a severe mitral agitation or a moderate to severe and hurry up to intervene on this without this being necessary. And the echocardiographic report should provide all this information and the likelihood of a successful valve repair. Thank you very much. I appreciate your attention. Uh, thank you, Dimitris, for the very informative talk you gave on this uh, 
almost hot clinically uh, topic, and I'm calling it hot because there are some discrepancies, as you mentioned in the literature, upon the practical utility and potential applications of the test. Uh, any, any questions from the audience? I agree. Uh, Dimitris, in the scenario of uh, having a patient who has already given uh, a treatment, uh, diuretic or angiotensin blocker or beta blocker, as in the scenario of Barlow disease, uh, young patient, what's the uh, proper uh, way to deal with the test? Should we interrupt the treatment or should we proceed to the test on, on treatment? Thank you for the question. That is a very, very, very nice question. Uh, I have to say that first, um, empirically, patients with Barlow disease, the, the young patients, from the patients at least that we see in our hospital actually, they have a very good behavior in the valve stress echo. And uh, very, I, I cannot remember actually many of them having a positive valve stress echo, even if the valve looks a bad valve, an ugly valve with bilifid prolapse and, uh, and the severe regurgitation. I feel that this is because of the reasons, due to the reasons of uh, the good ventricle and the good contractile reserve. Regarding the medication, what I uh, think is better, yes, the diuretics plays an important role. So I feel that it is better not to do the test under diuretics because it's not real. However, the beta blocker, uh, uh, may reduce the exercise capacity and give us, again, a false idea about the exercise tolerance of the person who is doing the test. I don't think that uh, it will finally uh, change a lot the measurements in the right side of the heart, the beta blocker. Okay, thank you, Dimitri.